Pierre, do you mind getting my backpack real quick? It's on the back on the chair, sorry. Oh, all right, we're having technical difficulties. Yeah, just put it here. Give me a moment. Everyone on live stream is going to think of anything funny. All right, here. I think like right here. Yeah. All right. Sorry, everybody listening on live stream. Oh, All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. How's that, honey? All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good evening. Sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties. It's all right. Um, well, let's pray together. Lord, um, <clears throat> Lord, you're the God who gets us through our technical uh, difficulties, Lord, uh, in life, Lord, and um, so thankful for your blood, for your mercy, for everything you've done uh, to save us, Lord. We ask that tonight we would be blessed through this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're doing our uh, Jewish hermeneutics. So, um, so all right, I guess more recently we've been doing basic, just Western hermeneutics. So if uh, you don't remember, uh, hermeneutics just a way, means just a way to study Scripture, right? And then, um, oh, here's my backpack. Get my Bible out of here. Um, so I usually ask the question, what do you people think of when they think of viewing the Bible through the Jewish lenses? And I think, at least I remember when I, you know, a long time ago, I always thought, oh, I want to understand the Bible, like the Jewish perspective, or understand more of the Jewish side of things. And what do we usually think of? We usually think of, like the, yeah, guy with the long beard, but also like we also think of the feasts, right? We think of the feasts, the sacrifices. Oh, that's the Jewish, like, like that's the Jewish perspective, like learning about the sacrifices. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been like in a Seder dinner. Okay, so that type of thing, right? And it's just like, oh, okay, it's interesting. Kind of see how the Passover works and how it relates to Christ. Um, that's what I thought, like, you know, the, the Jewish perspective was looking at scripture. And it would blow me away, right? Like, it's, it's amazing to see that. But that's not all it is. It's a lot, it goes a lot deeper than that. Um, we have to understand that uh, the Bible didn't come out of a vacuum, right? So I used to think this. I used to think, wow, Jesus was a great teacher. He came in, and then he said things that nobody had ever heard before, and he shocked the world when he came. And... Um, to be honest, when you really look at the Bible honestly, um, it wasn't like that. When Jesus was born, the earth didn't quake, right? You know, nothing, nothing happened. It was just a, a poor boy, a poor little baby being born, you know, in a barn. And, you know, the earth didn't quake. The nations didn't tremble. Uh, only a few shepherds knew of the coming of Jesus, right? Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, not, not to sound blasphemous, but a lot of the things Jesus said were necessarily new. But um, he was God, and so he knew how to say the right things to people. What he did was he took, he knew men's hearts. He knew how the rabbis taught in that time. He knew the culture, right? He created those people. They were his people. He knew them. And so he used the things he were familiar with to really show them who he was. Um, <clears throat> and so one of the things that we're going to talk about is uh, Midrash. So uh, in 1 Timothy, right, um, Paul tells Timothy to uh, rightly divide the word of truth. And that is in... Uh, is it 1 Timothy, Mark, or 2 Timothy? I always get them mixed up. 2 Timothy 2, 
15, right? Here we go. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we talked about that a little bit, that that word dividing means to cut. It means to uh, sk be skillful. And, um, and it was a tent-making term, Paul being a tent-maker. Cut the word of God correctly. Be skilled in dividing it. Uh, now, Paul really exhorts Timothy in First and Second Timothy, uh, remember all the things I taught you, don't forget. And so, well, what did Paul teach Timothy? Well, he taught him the word, but not only the word, but he taught him how to study the word. And so, um, that's, that's where, um, I, well, I'll, I'll pose this question. Have, have you guys ever wondered why the Pharisees understood Jesus? Go to Matthew 21. 21.45. Um, oops, one more page over. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. And it's a parable of the wicked vine dresser, which actually comes from uh, Isaiah, right? Um, it's, once again, Jesus came and he taught things no one ever said before, no one ever heard before. He was teaching from Isaiah, and they understood what he was saying. Uh, let's go to Matthew 15, 12. Then his disciples came and, said, uh, came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Um, why is that? Uh, why is it the Pharisees understood, but the disciples didn't? Well, when you, when you look at it, Jesus was a rabbi. He understood, he used midrash. He used a certain exegetical tool that they used, and he used, basically he used it against them. And it would be like, um, I mean, it would be like the Pharisees were the scholars of their day. So Jesus knew how to speak on their level. That's why the disciples didn't understand it. They weren't, they weren't educated at that level yet. Uh, they didn't know the scriptures at that level that the Pharisees would have. They wouldn't have studied in those schools. Of course, they learned from Jesus how to do it. So when they became apostles and the Holy Spirit, right, entered them, um, it wasn't just, it wasn't just um, the Holy Spirit came upon Peter and suddenly he started saying things and he, he didn't even know what he was saying. No, uh, yes, he was empowered by the Spirit, but also he remembered the things Jesus taught him and was using those things to interpret Scripture. And then there was men like Paul, right, who were academics like the Pharisees, but um, it wasn't that Jesus had some sort of magic power where he said something and Pierre can hear it, but Marco can't. Uh, it wasn't like that. It was, um, he was using Midrash. He said something that Pierre the scholar, who studied the Bible for 50 years, wouldn't know. But Marco, the new believer, right, wouldn't understand. And so that's how it was. And also, I'm realizing, Marco, half an hour is not going to be long enough for this, but it's all right. Um, so, so what is Midrash exactly? And I keep throwing this term out, Midrash. Um, okay, well, basically, it's a Jewish form of exegesis. It's a, it's a way to interpret the Bible, but it's the way the Jews interpreted the Bible. Um, Paul taught using Midrash, and Jesus taught using Midrash. I'm going to explain what that is more. Uh, but we need to get our definition straight. Um, because when you, go, when you guys go online, you have to be really careful when you're researching this stuff. Um, because there's people that don't know what they're talking about when it comes to this. Uh, and there's people that abuse this. Um, there's two sides, right? There's one side that says, oh, it's Jewish. Don't follow it, right? It's a bunch of nonsense. But then there's the other side that says, oh, it's Jewish. So now we got to, Hebrew Roots gets into this sometimes too. Because he starts saying, oh, it's how Jesus and, and the apostles interpreted, but 
they abuse it and they start um, and they start um, um, they go let's see how do I put it they they it's they go too far with it as far as they start coming up and, and getting into Gnosticism. A lot of, well, we'll get into it in just a moment. I'll, I'll just keep going. So um, the first, so definitions of Midrash, okay? Uh, midrash, the way we're using it tonight, it's an exegetical tool. It's a hermeneutic. It's the way that the Jews study the Bible. Um, but a Midrash, Midrash can also mean a sermon. So, for instance, I can say John, First John, sorry, uh, John, or uh, John chapter 1 is a midrash, is a sermon on Genesis, on the creation story. Okay, so people do use it in that term. So midrash, a way of teaching, a way of understanding the Bible, but the second is also people use it as a term just to mean sermon. Okay, a midrash. Um, there's some ob objections, though, to midrash, right? The first is midrash is not in the Bible. People will say that. The word Midrash is not in the Bible. Um, well, that's because your Bible is translated in English. <laughs> you know, that's why you don't see it. I had, I had Jehovah's Witnesses come to our door on Saturday, and, uh, you know, one of their objections was, your Bible doesn't say Jehovah. I said, well, my Bible, well, this is an English translation. It's not Latin, because that's really what Jehovah is. But also, uh, if, if you read the footnote, not the footnotes, but the, the uh, notes at the beginning of the King James, New King James Bible, uh, the translators tell you why they translated things a certain way. And whenever you see the word LORD in all caps, that's, that's Yahweh. That's how they decided to translate it. Um, so it is in the Bible, just it's in, but we're, we're reading it in English. Um, so where's Midrash then? Well, let's go to um, 2 Chronicles 13.22. Now the acts of Abijah, his ways and his sayings, are written in the annals of the prophet Edo. Uh, the word annals there is actually Midrash. Uh, I said, uh, sorry, 13, uh, 1322. Yeah. Um, just for the sake of time, it's also in, um, in uh, 2 Chronicles 24, 27. Well, I mean, it's just down the street. Let's, uh, let's go there. 2427, 2 Chronicles 2427 says, Now concerning his sons and the many oracles about him and the repairing of the house of God, indeed they are written in the annals in the midrash of the book of Kings. So it's in the Bible. It's there, but it's in Hebrew. All right, so that's the first objection. Midrash is not in the Bible. It is in the Bible. Um, second objection is midrash is Kabbalistic Gnosticism. And once again, you have to define your terms, right? Um, if I say... I saw a house fly. Would you say, Sergio's crazy. He said he saw a flying house. Well, that's stupid because I know what I meant was I saw, you know, a fly, house fly. Okay, but that's what people do with this. Oh, he said Midrash. He means Kabbalistic Gnosticism. That's not what it is, okay? Um, Kabbalah has something called Midrash, but it's not what we're talking about. It's something completely different. Uh, and it's, it's Gnosticism, what they do, right? They look at this, um, they look at the Zohar, and, and it's uh, the mystical book. Uh, Marco, you're probably more familiar with it than I am. I haven't read it too much. Yeah, okay. So Marco says basically it's like a Jewish horoscope. Um, you know, um, it's, not, it's not really Midrash, okay? It's not, it's not what we're talking about, what Paul and Jesus use. They didn't, they didn't say crazy stuff, right? It's like when an... an when we say, let's meditate, we mean, let's read scripture together. Let's think about it. Let's let it fill our minds. And New Ager says, let's meditate. They mean, let's empty our minds, right? Um, completely different definitions. We have to define our terms. But once again, people go on the internet and they, and they search, they type in Midrash, and what do they get? They get the Zohar, Kabbalah, and all this stuff. No, and then they go, oh, look at those heretics. That's not what we're talking about. You have to... We have to define our terms. You have to understand what we're trying to say. The third is, um, well, Midrash is a bunch of Jewish nonsensical books. Um, 
Uh, first off, people that say that have not read the Midrashim, that's what they're called. There are some books called the Midrashim. They were written 3rd, 4th century, right? Marco read about? Okay. 3rd, um, 4th century. Uh, it's actually quite interesting because it does give you some insight. It is a little bit later than the 1st century when Jesus and Paul were around. But it does give you some insight into how they um, interpreted the Bible. Now, I'm not saying go read it, believe everything. There is some stuff that's weird in there. But there's some very interesting things. Things. Like, for instance, um, Midrash Ruth actually talks about how Moses is the good shepherd. And it's really interesting because, um, you know, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but it says that um, when there's a breach in the wall, then Moses, the good shepherd, makes himself the wall. But what did Jesus say? He said, I'm the good shepherd. I am the gate. Okay? Uh, really interesting. Now, there's theories about that. I guess I won't get into them too much, but okay, I'll say it. Uh, but, but they're trying to say that that the Jews were trying at that time, trying to uh, kind of cater or like attract Christians. So they were using some of the same analogies. I don't know how true that is, but it is quite interesting nonetheless. Yes, there are the Midrashim. Yes, it, they do say some weird things in them, but there's some stuff in it that's very interesting, um, which kind of lets you see their mindset when they were thinking of stuff. So um, the Midrashim I recommend as um, history books. So you can understand what what they were thinking, uh, but I don't rec. But Zohar, when you get later into the Middle Ages and stuff, it, it's all a bunch of nonsense. So it's very much it's like the NAR of Judaism, basically. But all right, um, some definitions that we need to understand. So the first is uh, peshut. Let me. Uh, Where's the marker? Let's see here. I see a blue one. Is there a black one? Uh, I'll use the blue. I think it'll be dark enough. All right. So we kind of went over this a little bit. So Peshut, Peshat. People pronounce it different. Uh, basically, it's a simple meaning. So we talked about that, right? There's a simple meaning. Um, second is pesher. Pesher is the deeper meaning to scripture. Um, the simple meaning, right? How do you get to the simple meaning? Well, that's what we did last time. We talked about how just read God's word plainly, okay? Read it for what it, what it says. Um, Use the inductive Bible study method. So observation, interpretation, application, right? Um, look at the Bible as if it was a book report. Now, that's only going to get you so far. because We saw that last week, right? Uh, we were looking at some passages, and we read them. And it's just like, oh, Jacob opened the well, mouth of the well for Rachel. Okay, I don't know what I get out of that. Um, not saying we don't. We will. But we're not there yet, okay? Um, but it's limiting. Um, but that's a good place to start because, yeah, there are passages you're going to read and you're going to understand what the Lord is saying, what God is saying in his word just by reading it, right? Um, so what about the deeper meaning? Well, you can't understand it. First, you can't understand it without understanding the plain meaning. That's like the first rule. If you don't understand the simple, you can't understand the deeper stuff. Um, and also, the deeper meaning is not Gnosticism. I don't say oh, well, the Lord just showed me that this passage means whatever I want it to mean. Uh, there's a notable example. I should have brought it, but uh, maybe I'll bring it next time. But uh, where Beth Moore, I think I talked about this last time as well, Beth Moore says that uh, Noah's ark, that, that Noah shut himself in the ark. Well, we shouldn't shut ourselves from the world with, it, with our phones, in our phones, our cell phones. Um, well, you don't understand the simple meaning, because the simple meaning is, not that Noah shut himself in the ark. The simple meaning is that God told Noah to build the ark and told him to call people to repentance, right? And then he went. And then God shut Noah in the ark. So understand the simple meaning before you can even understand, come up with a deeper meaning, right? If the deep, her deeper meaning, deeper meaning falls apart when you look at it that way, okay? Um, we went over this uh, a couple weeks ago, right? But in 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 2 and 3, we talked. We saw this uh, already. Uh, we won't read that right now. But um, Paul tells the Corinthians that um, 
without the Holy Spirit, you can't understand the deep things of God. But also, he's telling the Corinthians that they were not understanding. He could not talk to them about the deeper things because they were not understanding the simple things. Um, they did not understand. Don't sin. <laughs> don't. That's like basic biblical doctrine right there, right? What did Paul? Uh, what did uh, James tell Paul? The Gentiles they should abstain from sexual morality, idols, things eaten with blood, things strangled, right? Uh, caring for orphans and widows, those are the simple things. Well, they, they weren't getting that. They were taking advantage of each other sexually. Um, they were um, you know, taking care of orphans and widows, we could say, taking care, caring for others. They, were, they, were, they weren't caring for others. They were suing each other. There was divisions. That's simple stuff. How am I supposed to give you, oh, I want to learn all the deep things. I want to learn all the things about the Bible. I want to be spiritual. Okay, stop sinning. What? Yeah, stop sinning. I don't get it. Okay, then I'm not, I can't teach you the other stuff. If you don't understand that, you can't go further, right? So that's what it is. All right, so. Hmm, I'm trying to think here. Where to go? Marco, will you give me 15 extra minutes? Sure. All right. We'll go 45 minutes. I think I can do it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to go through the seven midot of Hillel. Midot means um, like uh, commandments, okay? Seven rules. Yeah, rules, commandments, okay? Um, Hillel was uh, the premier teacher of Israel. So... Um, he was actually born in, in, uh, in Babylon and was one of the exiles that came over. Um, you guys remember um, Gamaliel in uh, the book of Acts? He was Paul's mentor, right? Um, uh, Gamaliel was the grandson of Hillel. So Paul was taught by Gamaliel. Um, and um, it was said of Gamaliel... It was said that when he died, that righteousness left the face of the earth. This is how high esteemed this guy was, Gamaliel, the grandson of, of Hillel. Um, he was a rabbi. His father was a rabbi, and his grandfather, Hillel, was a rabbi. So you see this tradition, and Gamaliel then teaches Paul. Paul was a rabbi. Paul taught the way the rabbis did. And so the basis of this was the seven rules of Hillel. Now, Hillel didn't come up with them, but he codified them. Okay, uh, and so we're just going to go uh, through them really quick. Um, so the first uh, principle, the first rule is this, is Kalva Homer. Just remember it, light to heavy. Someone's going to write, I'm going to write them in English. Oops. Light to heavy. So this rule basically means this. Um, Something in a light situation will be of more importance in a heavier situation. Okay, light to heavy. Um, if uh, you do a, a word search in your Bible, let's go to Bible software, anything. Just type in the word, the phrase, how much more. Do a phrase search. How much more, you'll find it all throughout Scripture. Um, it's usually characterized by this. Not always. There's... There's uh, more advanced forms of it, but you'll see this. And so basically it goes like this. Um, let's go to Luke 12, 24, right? Because what I want to do too is I want to show you that it's used in Scripture. A lot of people say it's not in the Bible. Well, you're teaching rabbinic Jewish nonsense. Yes, I am. Absolutely. Um, and Paul taught it too. Um, Luke 12, 24, we should, know, we should be pretty um, familiar with this. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouses nor barns, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? How much more, right? Do you guys understand that? Um, the birds, they're important. They're God's creation. We'll look at them. They, God feeds them. God takes care of them. Um, what's more important than a bird? Us, the very image of him. Is How much more important are we? Will God not also take care of us? OK? 
Okay? Um, go to Romans 11.24. All right, Paul talking to Gentiles, right? For if you were cut, right, and, and uh, this goes against, oh, uh, God, um, God cast off the Jews. They're no longer his people. The church replaces his people. Okay, well, for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, Gentiles, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So what's Paul saying? Look, Gentiles, you're a wild olive tree. You're branches of a wild olive tree. Um, if you're going to be grafted into a natural one, right, that's the less situation. Look, you're going to be grafted into the natural tree. Well, don't you think that God will certainly get to the natural branches, right? and graft them back onto the tree? Oh, no, 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 God, God, the church replaced Israel. That's not what it says. Paul uses a rabbinic argument to show us that he has not cast off the Jews, okay? All right, so number two. It's a gezerah sheva, that's in Hebrew. Uh, basically, cut equally. Um, now, I find it interesting. This, uh, I don't think this correlates with 2 Timothy 2.15, but, but I find it interesting that one of the principles of Hillel is called to cut equally, right? To rightly divide, and, and that's what Paul tells Timothy. Now, Paul is not specifically referring to this, but I just find that interesting, okay? Um, but that's what, that's, that, that's what this rule is called. But anyways, basically uh, it's this. Um, You can correlate two verses if they have a phrase in, or word in common. Okay. Um, let's go to Leviticus 19.18. So if two passages have a word or phrase in common, there's some connection between them, basically. And the Jews would usually use this to, um, to, uh, to basically try to interpret the law. Okay. This law, this law here is similar to this law has a word or phrase similar. So there's probably, so, you know, that's how they, they would interpret it. But let's look at it. Leviticus 19.18. Um, now, here's the thing. Um, I was talking to my friend Grant, who most of you know. Uh, it's, it's hard because a lot of these rules, like some of them overlap. We'll see that in a moment. Uh, so I was trying to figure out, ah, what's Jesus using here? What's he doing here? It's a lot of overlapping, you know, so it can be quite difficult to figure out what exactly, um, what rules are exactly are being used because to them it was just natural, right? We're here in, in the 21st century trying to learn Jewish hermeneutics and trying to figure things out. To them it just flowed. That's just how it flowed. Um, I find the more that I study, though, that it does flow. Um, but, you know, uh, but anyways, um, um, but like I said, you'll, you'll find that, that some of these things fit together, and we'll see, we'll see that in a moment. Um, Leviticus 19.18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. All right. Let's go to Deuteronomy 6.15. All right, you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. Sorry, I started verse 14. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Uh, oh, boy. I am in the wrong place. Is it? Oh, why, why do I do this? I always do this. All right, well, I'll just quote it because you guys know it. So we, we do know that, uh, Marco, unless you can find the reference for me, but we do know um, that in the Old Testament tells us you shall love the Lord your God, right? With all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. You can find it for me, Marco. 
Um, so notice, right? Leviticus 19.18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Is it 6.5? Oh, there we go. Okay, and these words, um, let's see. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. Thank you, Vivian. Um, so notice, right? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. What's the connection there? What does Christ say? What does Paul say? What does even John say, right? Uh, First John, what, what does he say? Well, if you love God, you're going to love your neighbor. Why? There's a connection there. You shall love. Okay? You love God, you're going to love your neighbor. Um, if you say you love your neighbor, if you hate your neighbor, you don't really love God. You don't have the love of God. But notice, right, that connection there. You shall love God. You can't separate the two. Love for God, love for your neighbor, right? Um, now, what wrong, it would, now, the wrong way to interpret this or abuse this would be this way. Oh, your neighbor is God because the, they both say the phrase, you shall love. That's wrong, right? Because God is not your neighbor, okay? God is God. He's Yahweh, all right? That's, that's like a, an example of how you could abuse it. Um, but anyways, principle three, uh, binyan av mekatuv echad, okay? Uh, basically, um, building, building a principle from one verse. All right. Let's go to First Timothy two thirteen. <clears throat> well, we'll start at verse twelve. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first. Then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. All right. Um, was Paul a woman hater? So some people will say. Was Paul anti feminist? Was Paul a misogynist? His culture, they hated women. That's why Paul says this. No. Principle three. He's building a teaching principle from one verse. He sees woman was made first, right? She was deceived first. Now, um, I think probably in the, one of the upcoming weeks, I do want to look at this passage in particular because I want to show how Paul goes back to the Old Testament to, to explain this, okay? Um, and, you know, the men all go, Amen, Sergio. Uh, well, men, this verse has a lot to say about men as well as women, okay? Um, but, once again, I'm using this to prove Paul is not culturally a uh, misogynist, he's looking at scripture, he's looking at the Old Testament, and coming with a, he's building a principle from this one verse, okay? Um, you could possibly also look at something like, for instance, um, don't muzzle the ox while he's threshing, right? He takes one verse and talking about oxes, well, what does animals have to do with anything? Well, he takes that and applies it to teachers, right? A worker or even a general principle, right? Hey, if you work hard, you're worthy of what you're working for, okay? One verse. Uh, principle four. Uh, let, me, let me read it, but we'll kind of skip that one because you'll see in a moment. Binyan av mishnai katuvim. So building a teaching principle pay, uh, based upon upon uh, two verses. So basically, the same thing as this, but two verses, okay? So, um, principle five. Kelal uferat perat vekelal. The general and the specific. The specific and general. Um, let's go to Romans 13, 8 through 10. I think we'll see it better here. So basically, it's taking a specific principle And turning it into a general one, um, or taking a general principle and combining it into one. And we'll see this in just a moment. Um,
So Romans 13, starting at verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Um, you want to follow God's law? Love your neighbor. Right? He takes specific Um, or he takes general principles, right? You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, and he sums them all up. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Um, This is the best way to describe it, right? Um, And, you know, for people that say Hebrew roots, right, they want to get into, oh, you need to follow the law and you need to do the feasts and everything. Um, Paul here tells me to love. You want to keep God's law? You know, I, actually, I, I, I don't, Mark, have you ever looked at this, this passage in like a, one of the Jewish Bibles, the ones they use? I wonder if they say Torah in there, because that would be a complete mistranslation, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Quite interesting, right? Um, love is a fulfillment of, if you want to say it that way, of the Torah. You know, it's like, uh, you know, how do you fight with that? <laughs> like, you, you want to fulfill God's law? Love. That's what Paul's saying. All right, principle six. Um, so five is, sorry, general. Two. Particular. All right, six. Um, What it says is it comes from comes from another place. So basically, it's kind of similar to to cut equally, right? Um, so you're taking some passages. If you're having trouble understanding certain pass a certain passage, um, if you bring in another passage, another a passage from another place. It will, even if the two passages aren't necessarily connected by context, um, you can kind of figure out what it's trying to say. I, I know that sounds confusing, but let's look at this. Um, if I can have one person go to um, Judges 13, someone else go to 1 Samuel 1, and I'll go to Luke 1. Okay, um, and I do not know the verse reference, but I'll give it. I'll, uh, you'll see it in, once, in just a moment, Dana. I'll uh, I'll read from Luke first, and then you. Um, so Luke, one. Okay, so Luke one fifteen. Um, this is about John the Baptist, right? Uh, an angel comes to Zacharias, his father. Uh, it says here, verse 15, You will be great, John the Baptist, you will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. All right. So, here's a question I would ask you guys. Um, was John the Baptist a Nazarite? Those of you who are familiar. Hmm? Most people with the general knowledge of this, um, would say, oh yeah, he was a Nazarite. Okay? Well, it doesn't say. It doesn't hear, say here specifically he was a Nazarite. So how do people come to that conclusion? Um, Dana, in uh, Judges, you're in Judges, right? Yeah, just read it out loud. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, does it say uh, razor shall not touch his head? About this is speaking about Samson, right? What verse is that? I forgot. Fourteen also says the razor shall not touch his head. Uh, 
Yeah, let me let me go there. I forgot. I completely forgot to uh, forgot to write down the reference here. But this is good. That would be search the scriptures for, uh, together, right? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, uh, verse five. So verse four. Now, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child, the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistine. Right? Um, okay. Now let's go to um, 1 Samuel 1. And I would ask the question too, right? Was Samuel a Nazarite? Well, uh, where is it? Is it verse 11? Uh, okay, let's see here. Yeah, so um, this is Samuel's mother, and she prays, O Lord of hosts, right? She's asking for a son. O Lord of hosts, you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me. Do not forgive your maidservant, but you will give your maidservant a male child, and I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. All right. So we use, basically... We use the passage in Judges to conclude that Samuel and John the Baptist were Nazarites. Okay? Why? Because no strong drink for John. Okay? Um, and, then, and, then for, um, and then for Samuel, it uh, says, No razor shall come upon his head. Right? Um, so that's basically how this rule is used, right? Um, so you're using, like I said, sim kind of similar to this. This is usually how they use it for the law. Uh, but this one, similar, right? You're connecting words and phrases, okay? The last one, the last principle is devar halamed meniano. Uh, basically, uh, the description here says a word that is learned from its own issue, Okay? I'm not going to write that. I'm just going to write context. And actually, this one, I'll, um, and we'll get more into this next week. Oops. Connecting, connecting words, phrases. Okay? So, in a, in a sense, I mean. The last one is context, and this is like, I mean, I don't even have to explain this. Just read it. <laughs> Just read it. Um, you know, a matter that is learned from its own subject. Just, just read it, and if it's, and say what it says plainly. That's the last one. Okay. Um, just read the scripture and, and learn it. Um, these are the seven rules of halal, right? For anybody who's taking notes, like this one. Two verses. All right. Um, so yeah, these are the, the seven uh, rules of Hillel. Um, like I said, a lot of them kind of go together when you're reading scripture. You, you see how Paul uses this. Um, there's a couple books. Um, there's um, um, Biblical Exegesis in the Apostolic Period by Richard Longenecker. It's really good. I'll bring a list of, of resources next week. Um, um, the, if, if you want to look a little bit more, there are, if you search online, just the seven midot. Actually, I'll, I'll write it real quick, just so anyone who's wanting to spell it. Um, uh, if you search for it online, um, you will find websites that list them and explain them. Uh, I, word of caution, uh, they're pretty much all Hebrew roots, weird websites, okay? Um, there's like the, then there's like the 13 Midot of Ishmael, and they get into a lot of weird stuff. Um, but, but those pages do have like a general definition of this, if you're wanting to look at it. Just be really careful. Don't browse any other part of the website. Uh, but, like I said, that book, Richard Longenecker's Biblical Exegesis in the Apostolic Period, really good book. I was actually using it. I was trying, I've, I've read it, I've just, I had to go over it again uh, for, for this. But, um, 
Uh, we'll talk more next week. Uh, I got a couple more definitions for us to learn. And then what I hope to do next week is to actually apply this, apply some of this stuff. Um, and just, just to give you guys like a, a good example. And in the upcoming weeks too, right? Um, this is something you see in Scripture using. This is what you see Paul using. People that say Paul uh, didn't teach like a rabbi. He rejected Judaism. Um, you know, uh, they, they don't know what they're talking about, right? Um, and, and, and also, you know, uh, the other thing too is it's quite interesting, right? Um, um, I, I'm pretty sure that some of us have seen the Bible in this way just from reading it. I know a lot of us are more familiar with it just because we've been coming to this fellowship and hearing Bible teaching done this way by Jacob and Marco uh, so much. Um, uh, but but um, I have heard people that probably have no clue what this is use it. Why? Well, because they study the scriptures. They read the Bible, and the Holy Spirit reveals to them how to see the scripture in this manner, right? Um, but it comes from studying. This stuff, like I said, this isn't beginner stuff. You need to learn. If you don't have the basics right yet, um, you don't want to do this because then you become like Beth Moore and abuse it, right? It's obvious Beth Moore, the, these other you know, so-called Bible teachers, like I heard Joel Osteen uh, give his interpretation of the parable of the sower, and it wasn't what Jesus said it meant. <laughs> you know, how do you come up with the opposite conclusion? I don't get it. Well, it's because you don't know the, they don't know the Bible. They don't know the simple stuff, so how are they going to even explain the deeper stuff? So, um, with that, uh, if anyone has any questions, you can, you can ask me afterwards. Um, and um, we'll go on to the next teaching. So let's pray. Lord, I just pray that um, in these things um, we would keep to heart, Lord. Lord, that um, these things that we learn, Lord, they're, they're for us to uh, learn how to be more like you, Lord. They're tools to grow, Lord, in obedience and righteousness to you, Lord. Um, they're not lofty words that we can hold over people's heads, Lord, but they're tools that your Spirit gave Paul, Lord. They're tools that your Son, Father, used, Lord, to teach us how to be like you, Lord. To teach us trust in you, Lord. Put our faith in you, Lord. We thank you so much that you've given it to us. We pray. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.